Welcome to this video on programming terminology. My name's Andy Wicks and in this video I'm going to go through some of those technical terms that make programming so difficult when you start. But before we get into any of the difficulties, I want to make it clear that you don't have to remember every word that you hear here. You'll be able to go back and look at the subtitles like this and find that bit of the video that you need to find that definition that is confusing you again. And before I start with anything to do with software, I'm going to start with some hardware. Imagine that behind me there is a street of houses and each house has eight windows and each window has a bulb in it. And there are millions of houses in this street. The first house will start with zero because we haven't been past any other houses to get to that one. The next house along, the second house, will be house number one and so on. That is how a computer sees things. Those bulbs are the bits, the ons and offs that the computer uses to house the information that you put in. That's called a byte. And a byte is just one piece of information. It's the smallest addressable part of the computer. In the olden days, when I was young, programmers said where data was stored. Nowadays, we have a better system. We have things called variables. And a variable is just a place in the computer's memory, somewhere on that street, and it has a name. The computer keeps track of the names of things and it knows the place where it is, which house it's stored in or which house is, and it knows the size. So it knows to have 10 houses worth of data or 4 houses worth of data, depending on what it's doing. The list, as I said, is maintained by the computer, so you don't have to worry. All you have to do is say, I want this piece of information, and the computer will go away, look at its list, and find that particular place, and it knows how many bytes to read, and then it does whatever it is you say you want to do with that variable. And it's called a variable because the contents of that memory can vary. You can change things. So you started off with Andy Wicks, and you want to get rid of that and put in a proper name, like yours. Now, in the olden days, we used to write computer programs as a long list of commands. And that worked fine, until the size of the memory started to grow. And as the computer's memory grew, so the programs got longer and longer. And now finding an error, or making changes, took a lot more time. So a very clever chap, Nicholas Wirt, came up with a really good idea. Wouldn't it be nice to break a program down into its constituent parts? These tasks, a method, a something that needs to be performed. And so we program these different methods, and each method then gets called as it's needed. And that has lots of advantages. First, if there's an error in my program, I need only look through that method that is used to do that particular task. Secondly, if I have a task that needs to be performed many times, I don't have to write the same code over and over again. I can just call that particular method. And if there's an error in that method and it's corrected, it's corrected in all the places in one go. And that makes programming a lot more efficient. Then they came up with the idea of some methods do things, and some methods return a piece of information. A method that returns a piece of information is called a function. So, for example, we may have a function that says, uh, go to my office and collect some sweets. The return value of the function is that packet of sweets. It may be that you want to find the sign of a particular angle. So you type in the angle, and the computer method works out the sign for that angle. And that makes programming a lot easier to understand. So you have methods, 
sometimes called subroutines, sometimes called procedures. We can't give it a simple name that we stick to because otherwise everybody would know what it means. We have these methods, subroutines or procedures that just do a task and we have functions that return a result. Now sometimes we can have a method or a function that takes a particular piece of information. So for example, to get that packet of sweets you need to know what my staff room is. So you need to know that my staff room is QM420. So this is a piece of information that is passed to the function. My colleague who has a different staff room but also wants you to get a packet of sweets will give you a different room number to go to. A parameter is just a piece of information that a method or a function needs to be able to do whatever it is you want it to do. And that makes it a lot more flexible. I now don't have to write a separate function for Andy and a separate function for my colleague. It can all be the same function with just a different room number. The final piece of terminology are classes and objects. A class is a data type that you define. So a class could be something like student. And student has particular pieces of information that it needs. Forename, surname, address, whether they've passed or not. But it also has its own methods and functions. So for example, pay fees, output a grade, and so on. And those all lumped together become a class. If I want to use a class, I have to create an object of that class. So many of you will be familiar with having to declare a particular variable. So I'm going to declare a variable age as integer. So age, int, and then I can put something in there. Depending on the language, different ways of doing it. Exactly the same happens with classes. If I want to use a class, I have to say which class I want and what I want to call this variable. So I might have something like student Andy and that declares a variable which is a class called Andy of type student. See these things are quite easy. It isn't as difficult as it seems but it will be much clearer once you get all the practice in and get to use these concepts for real.